And hello everyone once again and welcome back to Ethnic Politics. This week we are discussing a topic that is both timely and highly controversial, and that is the ethnic politics of black identity. Now I want to emphasize before I begin that I am no expert on black politics. Um, I am not an authoritative scholar on black cultural identity. And this lecture is by no means exhaustive of a subject that could not only fill a number of books, um, but fill an entire library. There have been entire courses that have been devoted to the study of black politics of identity. And with the um, new bits of information that we have been getting over the past year or so, um, that connect political identity, political and cultural identity of uh, black communities uh, to uh, what is increasingly seen as pervasive and systemic discrimination in this country against them. Um, what we are discussing here only scratches the surface and embeds some of the more important elements of contemporary American political culture within the larger concepts of ethnic politics. So this is just a sampling. This is just a taste of what is a larger, far more pervasive issue uh, that requires an entire course all on its own. Um, the, the readings that we will be examining for this coverage um, includes a couple of essays by Cornell West, all collected within his 1993 book, Race Matters. And we're going to be augmenting that with a chapter in Henry Giraud's America at War with Itself, uh, Sandra Bland's America, which brings much of the discussion of nihilism in black America into uh, contemporary discussions. Uh, this, of course, um, brings up the rather uncomfortable and inconvenient truth of black people being far more likely to be systemically discriminated by and ultimately murdered. Unfortunately, that's the only word to say, murdered by police officers. And I'm sure that this is an incredibly controversial topic. There are those on multiple sides that have their own narratives, their own um, arguments that justify their own beliefs. But in this lecture, we are going to be looking at how pervasive elements of institutional discrimination and harassment against black communities in the United States have led to um, a larger sense of collective nihilism, disengagement, disappointment, um, where communities have effectively lost hope that anything will really get better uh, in the future. And when people wonder why um, communities suddenly explode with rage, and it's not just the Los Angeles riots of the early 90s, but it's the more recent um, displays in Ferguson, in Flint, in Minneapolis, and elsewhere. Um, it is not just simply a display of you know, collective raw rage, but it is a reflection of pent-up anger, frustration, disappointment, and yes, once again, nihilism that has largely characterized many of these communities into thinking that nothing is ever going to get better and every time that another one of their own is murdered by the police or even more so the police officers that are um, involved in this altercation end up um, you know walking uh, end up being found not guilty um, it just reaffirms in many people's minds that um, you know, equality is, you know, two-tiered at the absolute best in this country, and that African-American communities uh, make up, predominantly make up, um, a level that is less um, um, privileged, that has less rights, and there really doesn't seem to be anything um, that will change that uh, in the near future. So this discussion will continue our larger topics of the role of transcripts, right? So we're taking our um, discussions of public and hidden transcripts from last week into a more case study oriented field this week. And we're really looking at when hidden transcripts become public through opposition, dissidence, rage, and rebellion. Um, it has, you know, taken uh, many Americans, many non-black Americans, many more affluent white middle-class Americans by surprise um, that a population that seems quiet, almost docile, all of a sudden explodes when something, you know, horrible happens to one of their own 
and you know the the initial reaction among outgroup members is in so many words you know like whoa where did that come from or you know why can't you be more uh, productive with your um, frustration and your anger why do you have to burn things down why do you have to um, you know dichotomize yourself between uh, your you know your group and 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 law enforcement um, and suddenly we begin to see how conflicting and competing narratives of race and identity in American political culture um, become practically applied uh, within these situations. And additionally, how collective memory and identity of one group will influence the collective memory and identity of the other. Um, so, you know, what, where we've been talking before about how group identity might be shaped and reinforced by collective patterns of behavior, ideals, values, beliefs, and practices, um, memories and group identities are oftentimes shaped by the activities of the outgroup member, by the other. And so if, for instance, and this is a real simplified way of looking at it, if the term Black Lives Matter um, resonates with the white community, and when I say resonate, I don't necessarily mean it's accepted, it just simply is understood, there is a segment of the white community that is going to turn around and say all lives matter, which again we cannot um, we cannot frame the all lives matter response without connecting it to the perceptions of the meaning of Black Lives Matter, and even within the all lives matter movement, if one can even call it a movement, it really just seems more of a of a reaction, a response, a reply, right? we can break that down into two uh, categories. One is the genuine belief that all races, all people's lives are important. But then there's the other um, narrative, the other group within that, that uses that slogan not as a way of relativizing black discrimination with others, but in a way trying to downplay, dismiss, um, even denigrate perceptions that blacks are somehow um, particularly discriminated against, when in fact they really are, but this is an inconvenient truth that many white Americans want to accept. So along with hidden and public transcripts, along with competing narratives of race and identity, we are also continuing discussions of political and cultural symbols of group identity. Um, out of um, the more, let's say, recent years of white versus black, subordinate versus dominant, security apparatus versus civilian conflicts in this country, right? we have seen the evolution of a number of symbols like the Blue Lives Matter flag, um, the Thin Blue Line flag to be even uh, more specific, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement to be more than just simply a hashtag, um, the reusing of earlier symbols within the Black Lives Matter movement, like the clenched fist, um, the colors of Pan-African unity, um, additional um, inclusions of more widespread symbols of, let's say, socialism, Marxism as a way of trying to create a sense of working class solidarity, not just between blacks, but blacks, other minorities, and, and, and you know, might I also add, other whites. So this is very much an ongoing phenomenon in American political culture right now. The Black Lives Matter movement has evolved beyond just simply um, as a form of protest against police brutality, but it's taking on increasingly um, a degree of social and political connotations that um, intellectuals like Cornell West can only be happy to note because of what he has seen as the, for lack of better word, you know, the political and the intellectual poverty of black leadership over the past, let's say, 35 or 40 years. The fact that the Black Lives Matter movement is um, sort of resembling many of the activist, grassroots, populist um, type of organizations that characterize the you know, pre-civil rights era movements of black identity, you know, it has become a socio-political force in and of itself that may very well tap into a groundswell of bitterness, disappointment, um, impatience 
that many black Americans, especially many young black Americans have with the current neoliberal status quo. And so I think that this continue, you know, these continued discussions work rather nicely with what we will be adding for evaluation this week. And we will, in addition to looking at the you know, current larger elements of black politics, we will be studying um, a collective culture of nihilism and disappointment in modern American culture. And this is not specific for the black community. I think it's fair enough to say, right? And if you're listening as an American and you are, let's say, 30 years or younger, maybe even 35, um, you probably feel that the last couple of years have just been one chronic disappointment after another. And while the euphoria of Trump being defeated might be felt by a number of people, it's unfortunately becoming clear that Biden is not going to be that major reformer, not that major savior that the Democratic Party uh, is trying, rather pitifully in my opinion, uh, to sell him on. But you know, even before Biden comes into the equation, right, I think that even if we were to take this beyond uh, the scope of politics here, I think that there is just this general sense among younger Americans that if there's, if there's no hope to look forward to in the future, um, you know, beyond that, there's nothing that really motivates people anymore. Um, and it's not that people are becoming lazy or apathetic. I think it's just because a growing number of Americans, and blacks especially, are beginning to realize that no matter how hard they work, and no matter how much energy and time that they put into something, um, their efforts are not going to pay off in something tangible, something that they can use as a way of getting ahead in life. And I think that this has a lot to do, and West points this out, and he's been, he and Giraud and others, Bernie Sanders including, um, have noted this for years, that the erosion of social safety structures and networks have majorly contributed to this sense of nihilism. Um, and these social safety structures have been uh, replaced um, gradually but definitively with the conforming pressures of neoliberalism and consumerism. Now, what does that all mean? It means that um, collective well-being has been um, systemically, surgically, and consciously attacked and replaced over the past 30 to 35 years by a set of beliefs that promote self-improvement um, at the expense of one's peers, but self-improvement simply through the acquisition of material products. I mean, that is effectively the understanding of consumerism. Um, it is not bad to go out and buy things, right? We need things to survive. But when our lives are evaluated, not just by the possessions that we have, but the types of possessions, the value within those possessions, our value in life is not that we were able to somehow afford a house or be able to pay rent in an apartment, but where that apartment is, right? Where that house is, location, status, um, image, bling, mind you, um, have largely replaced um, many of these previous social safety networks um, with the promise of wealth, affluence, riches, but there's a greater sense of atomization of society. There's a greater emphasis on individualization, which again is not necessarily problematic if these social safety networks are still there. But when they continue to be eroded, defunded, deregulated, um, you know, we in 2021 begin to see ourselves as just kind of, you know, just the, you know these 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 lost cogs in a larger network that we have no idea what it is that we're doing for said network, or whether we're contributing to anything for ourselves. Uh, we begin to feel lost, isolated, um, dis, you know, detached from our community, from our peers. Everybody is, you know, so obsessed with trying to survive 
that there is no time for community development and there's really no emphasis on the collective well-being of a community um, within the understanding of well-being and life accomplishments. Now, that in of itself is pervasive across the country. When we look at the African-American community, argues Giraud, West, and others, we also note that to this is the added levels of systemic, what I'll say conscious, subconscious, more so subconscious, uh, most people don't know that this is being performed, but in other cases, they know exactly. Racism and exclusionary politics in American political, economic, and and especially security circles. Right? This is the big inconvenient truth of this discussion today. The United States is still operating along institutional structures of discrimination, racism, and the promotion of one group of people over another. And whether or not you are listening to this and agreeing or disagreeing, right? And if you feel that that's not the case, that this is a political statement, the United States is the most open and tolerant country in the world, that's fine, right? That's fine. But what we need to understand is that within this structure, whether you believe it or not, the Black Lives Matter movement has emerged. And the Black Lives Matter movement um, is, um, at least among some of its real, you know, political and intellectual, um, you know, proponents here, more than just simply a collection of people angry at the system, wishing that they had better things, right? That's, that, that's sort of a lazy way, that's a dismissive way of, you know, examining what Black Lives Matter is. I think in many cases, Black Lives Matter is still emerging into some kind of socio-political, socio-economic response to the inequalities of corporatism, neoliberalism, free market capital fundamentalism by reassessing minority politics right, within a larger socio-economic analysis. Right? So the thing to take away thus far from this discussion is that the Black Lives Matter movement, which is not any kind of organized, um, unified set of movements so much as it is really a collection of ideas, theories, and responses to the current socio-political, socio-economic status quo, is finally emerging as some collective response, some collective set of hidden transcripts um, that are finally addressing many of these issues of inequality, discrimination, and racism. And so it's within this subject, again, whether you, you know, believe in it or not, whether you accept Black Lives Matter as legit or not, that we base this discussion on. And the first thing that we base it on is the understanding that black identity is seen as really a subordinate identity. Right? It is not part of the predominant collection of American ethnic politics. It is not that it is um, opposed. It's not that it is not included in American society, but that even among some of its more accepting white communities, black identity is still seen in some way as secondary, um, handicapped, um, less developed, uh, somehow um, problematic or, you know, in need of help and assistance. And, you know, this stems not just years or decades, but centuries, you know, into the development of this country. And so black identity is a subordinate identity as, you know, a group of economically disadvantaged people of color. Black American identity is shaped by institutional legacies of slavery and segregation and cultural legacies of white supremacy, minority stigmatization, and what was mentioned in the readings as a racial caste system. Now, here is where things get rather controversial because, you know, the question of whether slavery still has an effect on political culture in America today Conservative groups will scoff at that, and they will say, 
Slavery was abolished more than a century ago. You know, the 14th Amendment had effectively, you know, done away with that. Um, you know, you all have had plenty of opportunities to, you know, pick yourself up by your proverbial bootstraps. You can't be hiding behind the concept of slavery when no one, no living person in this country, um, you know, benefited, profited, you know, had anything to do with said slavery. And the problem with that assessment is that it fails to take into account what I just mentioned before, the, the legacies, the institutional and the cultural. The institutional legacy of slavery itself may no longer exist, but elements of that um, disproportionate degree of um, inequality, the legacy of segregation, of racism, right, permeated well beyond slavery, First and foremost, into a number of, you know, Jim Crow laws, um, you know, institutional rules and regulations of apartheid for at least another century. It also permeated into um, political thinking. Um, and here is where things become a bit more vague and interpretive. But, you know, the understanding that the black community is still somewhat disadvantaged or unable to do anything on its own without some kind of intervention, some kind of assistance from more predominant, more affluent white communities, sort of perpetuates these notions of institutional as well as cultural legacies. Now, cultural legacies oftentimes are much more decisions, choices that people in power make. And you know, when we, when we continue to view Right? When we continue to view a certain group of people as disadvantaged, as less than equal, as problematic, um, or as just simply as people that just need to be placated, you, know, you don't even have to think about racism or discrimination. You just have to just kind of show some token rhetorical adherence. Uh, to them and their views and f and kind of be like, all right, you know, I've made my, uh, you know, as, a, as a campaigner, as somebody who was on the election trail, you know, I've made my speech at this, you know, local famous black church in Atlanta or uh, Selma, Alabama, or I, you know, visited the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, all right? I, you know, sort of checkmarked all this stuff off. It shows that I'm, you know, woke, I'm inclusive. I don't have to really do anything else. You can't accuse me of being a racist, um, it still doesn't get to the heart of the matter. It still doesn't get to the heart of the matter that there are, you know, that the community still feels that there is a disproportionate level of inequality and discrimination. And so in this, we add to that, right, the, you know, the, the harassment by the police, the irrelevancy that is often given to them by political officials beyond a few rhetorical, you know, sound bites and uh, little clips to show on the six o'clock evening news. The exploitation by economic conditions. I mean, this is certainly the case when we examine the politics of, let's say, gentrification. Uh, I'm just right here in, in New York, right? Gentrification of many areas of Harlem, the Bronx, Brooklyn, um, you know, displaces people of color who cannot afford, um, you know, the new buildings with higher rents. Uh, the cost of living just, you know, effectively removes them from, you know, the visual landscape. How about the underinvestment in education settings where, you know, more affluent schools have better tax systems, they're, you know, the, the suburban areas tend to have more resources at their disposal. And, you know, the, the, the um, you know, the, the typical inner city school that is underfunded, understaffed because of all cuts to the budget, to after school programs. You know, John Q. Taxpayer doesn't want their, you know, money going to things that don't necessarily benefit them. And what ends up happening, right? A paltry school system, a weak educational system um, makes a whole generation of students uh, somehow disadvantaged, um, you know, uncompetitive for whatever emerging jobs and career opportunities are out there you know, beyond the service sector. And if many in these school systems believe that that's as good as it's going to get, well then there's no point in striving for anything better. There's no point in trying to work to achieve um, evol you know, evolving, leveling up out of one's community. And of course, with all of this said, we look at the pervasive stereotyping in cultural and entertainment circles. Um, 
the understanding that um, urban culture is somehow indicative of what black communities not only are, but want, right? The understanding that there is this, uh, you know, sense of ghetto glam, um, urban grit. Um, there is this sense of even within movies that are not meant to stereotype the black character, but almost provide almost like a humorous, positive stereotype on them, right? The black character is always going to be somehow different from the white character, uh, from the Latino character. They're going to have a certain set of attitudes and beliefs. They're going to have a certain way of evaluating the world. They're going to have a certain, um, you know, um, sense of self-preservation, right? And that, you know, sort of adds to the expectation of not only what they do, but who they are and what they believe in. And so with all of that said, right, black identity still remains somewhat of a subordinate identity in modern American political culture. It might not necessarily be subordinate in the direct sense of outright discrimination, at least not in pop culture, um, the entertainment sectors, um, and, you know, even with, you know, even within political sectors, right? There, there's no sense of, there's no form of outright racism. But as I've been mentioning, um, the black community tends to be taken for granted as a monolithic voting entity that votes Democratic. There's no need for the Democratic Party to really cater to them. In fact, probably the best example of this subordinate identity was a few months ago when Biden, uh, again, when Biden is not told what to say and he speaks his mind, this is the person that we are, you know, that we have to deal with. When Biden said, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. Not you aren't black, but he decides he's going to speak some kind of, you know, street slang to an African-American who takes high offense at this by saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, you know you're telling me that, I, that what I should do in order to af assume black identity is to vote for you as opposed to Donald Trump. Um, and again, the, you know, the person wasn't necessarily in favor of Trump, but the question was rather poignant. Why should I vote for you? And if the answer is simply because I'm not Donald Trump, because I'm not a Republican, and that's all that you all need to know, well, that's not good enough anymore, right? Their votes are not just simply taken for granted without any kind of promises to make lives, make conditions better. But that whole statement, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black, already implies a dominant speaking to a subordinate with the expectation of what the subordinate is supposed to do. So this adds to our larger understanding of black identity um, being formed around a record of harassment and discrimination. And this has become all the more apparent in the past couple of years as social media has for lack of better, you know, um, observation, simply recorded what has been going on all along. You know, I don't think that there's any um, uptick in discrimination. I don't think that there is a, a specific amount of increase in police harassment and brutality against black communities. It's, it's, just, it's just that this has just all been posted on YouTube. This has all been shared on Twitter and Facebook. This stuff has been happening for decades, if not centuries. And the record, unfortunate, is bleak. There is a, you know, routine encounters with authorities um, give black people much more likely the uh, possibility of being sent to jail, um, being shot, being unlawfully detained, or just simply being killed by the police over any other group of people, right? Police are 31% more likely to pull over a black driver than a white driver. And, you know, with all of these, you know, with these multiple, multiple cases of, you know, a black motorist being pulled over for speeding or failing to signal, whatever it happens to be, how do we go from you were pulled over because you failed to signal to having, you know, the police body slam you to the ground, handcuff you, throw you in the back of a car, and in some cases just, you know, die, either right there on the spot like, you know, Eric Gardner, who was effectively harassed for selling cigarettes on the streets, right? Nothing else, right? Or Sandra Bland, 
who was pulled over for failing to, you know, I don't know, use her turn signal or whatever it was. How is it that she was thrown in jail, right, thrown into, you know, police detention, and a few days later found dead, right, and with the idea that she committed suicide? Now, how does that happen? Or a young, uh, you know, teenager like Tamir Rice, who was shot by a passing police officer in a car because he had a toy gun. And apparently the cop thought that he had a real gun. And the police officer shot him. He wasn't killed instantly, but was lying there on the ground before, you know, anybody came to help him, before an ambulance came. The police officers actually prevented um, anyone from coming to help him. His sister, who saw this, came running, found, you know, saw this. The police stopped her, threw her in the back of, a, a, of the police car. So it's like, you know, you look at this and you think to yourself... <laughs> I mean, it, it is very, very, very hard to argue against the idea that there is systemic racism against a certain group of people. And the sad reality is that, you know, the Rodney Kings, the Trayvon Martins, the Michael Browns, the Eric Gardners, the Sandra Blands, Tamir Rices, these are the people that we know. Missing is what's not recorded. Missing is the, you know, missing are the dozens and dozens and dozens of cases where someone is not whipping out their iPhone and recording all of this. The ones that we know about are those that have recorded it. And that doesn't even include the centuries of targeting before, sec before such technology was even available, right? And, you know, let, let's add to this, you know, let's add to the understanding that it's not just police brutality, but within the lifetime of many living Americans today, lynching was still not just practiced, but seen as a community pastime where, you know, members of the community w would, would track down, uh, you know, a poor uh, black American, tie him up, lead him to a tree, and hang him. And there would be people taking pictures. They'd be, you know, bring the kids. It's a great family fun day. And it's almost as if, like, vigilante justice has been served. But would this same type of justice been given towards a white person. Absolutely not. That's the that's for the police to somehow solve. But yet mob rule somehow feels justified in performing this heinous act. And so this record of harassment and discrimination, you know, notes again another very inconvenient truth that in this country police have the ability to kill people of color and immigrants with near immunity. Right? With near, you know, like they can almost get away with it um, while relying on legal defense funds, uh, police unions, which effectively uh, tell the, you know, officers and their families under investigation, hey, don't worry about it. Your pension, your life insurance, your, you know, your financial security is taken care of. So even if you're given desk duty for six months to a year, or even in the rare case where you're forced to resign, um, your pension is still there. And once the public has, you know, moved on from the story, you know, you can very quietly just apply for a job in another police department and we'll just, you know, sort of pick up where it leaves off. So if you know that, you know, you've got enough organization on your side to help you, in many cases, get away with murder, um, you're going to feel much more secure and feel much more powerful in, in what you can do, um, you know. In addition to that, we have conservative white social groups that come to their aid. Um, they start GoFundMe, um, you know, fu uh, drives. Um, there's, you know, media saturation, especially in social media. Um, you know, take a look at the overwhelming degree of support from white conservative groups uh, towards that kid, Kyle Rittenhouse. Remember him? One that goes to, um, you know, one of these uh, Black Lives Matter uh, rallies from out of state with a, you know, AR-15 or whatever gun that it is, and decides he's just going to start shooting people and helping the police. And he's seen as a hero, not as a murderer or a terrorist, right? All of these um, effectively show the leverage that one group has over the other, um, you know, within this country. It shows that if you are part of this official security apparatus of government, you have a much more likely chance of getting away with a crime 
than otherwise. And beyond just that, the official discourse within the media, and I'm not talking about Newsmax, OAN, Fox News. I am talking about even mainstream media like CNN, even MSNBC at times. They will continue to give the benefit of the doubt to the law enforcement and the law enforcement officers through narratives of patriotism, um, the idea that officers are stressed out, they need to, th you know, they can't stop and think about what might be, you know, they're told to basically think and act as self-preservatory at the, at the moment. Um, you know, all of this, you know, sort of adds to our understanding, right, that these individual officers are, you know, have to make splits, uh, split level decisions, um, unfortunate and tragic as they are, um, in this atomized society that we all live in. And so even while many of these officers end up being demonized, especially uh, those that you know, were clearly, clearly um, abusing their levels of power, um, once the story moves on, we just move on as well. And unfortunately, um, you know, when you think about this, the Trayvon Martins, the Eric Gardners, the Sandra Blands, the Tamir Rices, I mean, these are the Rodney Kings of this generation, of this time period. You know, Rodney King created an entire two to three day explosion in Los Angeles. Today, we are almost numb to all of this. Like, oh, another one was killed. Almost to the point of, what are you gonna do, right? Almost to the idea of, what can we do? I mean, what can we do that hasn't been done beforehand? We can hold vigils, we can hold our elected officials accountable, and some of our elected officials might once again say the never again and no more and how much longer will this be. It, you know, it's sort of up there with, this, you know, with uh, school shootings. And at one point there was a school shooting almost every month, and after a while people just got tired of being appalled and aghast. We just become numb to the whole thing. And so once this is known, right, well, it's not a surprise that, you know, a culture of nihilism sets in. Now, what exactly is this? Now, as I said, within the larger, con uh, within the larger concepts um, of, you know, studies of political culture, even within studies of, let's say, um, you know, democratic um, activities, social capital, you know, nihilism is an extreme, extreme element of what I will call the, a, a culture of disappointment, right? A culture of disappointment is when people lose faith in their elected officials. They become cynical. They become apathetic. They, they stop believing in, you know, um, you know, elected officials who, you know, continuously do nothing more than cry wolf uh, without doing anything. Nihilism, on the other hand, is a sense of horrifying meaninglessness, Right? Pervasive hopelessness and lovelessness, right? This is beyond, this is beyond disappointment. Nihilism is this sense of utter despair, right? A sort of a numbing detachment from others and a self-destructive disposition towards the world. Nothing is going to get better, but it's not because our elected officials aren't meeting up to our expectations, but even outside the realm of politics, social-wise, economic-wise, cultural-wise, it's just, it, it's just, it's just a constant um, series of doom, right? So it's a belief that nothing will ever get better and a realization that things might actually be getting worse as time progresses. So politicians have largely failed their communities. I mean, that goes without saying. But economic improvement is increasingly difficult, if not impossible. So, you know, stories of the stock market rallying or jobs being created um, tends to be more fictive than real. Now, what's the point of the stock market rallying if you are still struggling to maintain uh, some standard of living on your own, right? When we live in a country where a $15 federal minimum wage hike seems to die at every, you know, opportunity, and the current Democratic Party just throw their, throws their hands up and says, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, we've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. Um, people begin to just wonder, well, what's the point, right? What's the point of getting up in the morning? 
So economic improvement is increasingly difficult, if not impossible. We add to this the, you know, the increased cost of living. We add to this um, you know, cuts to unemployment, welfare, social security, and a social stigma that compartmentalizes one into a subordinate category. So, you know, while, you know, a feeling of, of, of nihilism is not, again, specific or particular to the black community, I mean, one can find it across the board, when you feel like this, but you also believe that you as a socio-ethnic group, you are defined by your skin color, and your skin color effectively stigmatizes you to behave and act and think in a certain way that is less from the standard norm, well then, it's not a surprise, right, that psychological depression sets in across the community. Uh, groups feel a sense of personal worthlessness, right, and victimhood um, is, I would say, rather genuine because you are, you're not necessarily born into thinking this, but you grow up pretty early realizing it, that the odds are against you, right? The odds are stacked against you. There are obstacles and pitfalls and all sorts of, you know, things that will just get in your way simply because of who you are. It has nothing to do with your own personality, it had nothing to do with what you have done or not done. It is simply because you are part of a subordinate group that is institutionally and culturally stigmatized. And among the talking heads on TV who constantly ask what is to be done about the black community, how can we alleviate their sense of helplessness um, neither side really seems to have an answer, right? And West points this out. The liberal structuralists just simply assume that all that's needed is economic advancement, right? Just throw money at the, you know, throw money at them and everything will be fine, right? That's the neoliberal approach. While conservative behavioralists just simply say, change your attitude, right? Stop thinking that you're a victim and start, you know, achieving, start, start uh, chasing after the American dream, right? There are a number of rich, affluent black people that you can look up to, right? And they'll just throw people out there like, well, take a look at, um, you know, Oprah Winfrey, uh, take a look at Bill Cosby, you know, before Bill Cosby kind of became Bill Cosby, right? Take a look at even Barack Obama, right? Are they kind of held down by their sense of stigmatism? No. The problem is that the Oprah Winfrey's and the Barack Obama's and others like them, they are more exceptions than the rule. And it ignores the idea that just on a socioeconomic level, blacks tend to just be just far more economically discriminated against than any other group of people. And so once that happens, you begin to realize, look, you, know, you don't give up just simply because. You give up because you understand how difficult it is to get out of that situation right, within this country. And, you know, in this sense, we kind of couple this nihilism with systemic breakdown. This is the one thing that the liberal structuralists tend to overlook, right? I'll just throw money at the problem and they'll, you know, be far better. West and others notes that, you know, the, the plight of the black community um, is connected to um, a pervasive sense of weakening of cultural structures of meaning that created and sustained these communities. So, you know, in the, you know, in the darkest days of the segregation period, right, in the period leading up to the civil rights movement when blacks were far more openly targeted, right, black communities, argues West, Giraud, and others, had their own social safety networks, their own social groups, both formal and informal, to kind of fall back on. They had their religious institutions, they had their civic organizations, and all of this sustained, right, networks of family and community. Now that's not to say that these have been destroyed today, but they have been um, notably eroded in their value and their relevancy. And so up until the early 1970s, the paradox was that blacks may have been, still even back then, far more discriminated against than other groups in the United States. They had the lowest suicide rate 
because there was this sense of solidarity among themselves. So they could always, always rely on their own networks, their own social capital to keep them going, right? To keep some kind of positive message that yes, things are horrible, but things will improve. What West argues is that market forces over the past 30 to 35 years have saturated and undermined uh, the moralities of black community life. Now, that's not to say, again, that consumerism itself is inherently evil. Now, we all in the United States have been prone towards accumulating material goods, um, you know, purchasing things that make us feel better. Um, retail therapy certainly helps. I mean, this is just a, a fundamental hegemonic belief in the American system. But consumerism, individualization, and the atomization of community um, has been particularly damaging to black communities uh, from the 1980s onwards. Um, in a way in which black leadership, black thinking, black group identity has become more and more dependent on something that is altogether created outside of that group. So it adds to the subordination. It adds to the understanding that black communities are dependent on lifestyle choices designed by and created by non-blacks. Now, is that itself problematic? Not necessarily, unless one realizes that these market forces have atomized what it means to be black, taken over the idea of community self-worth, and turned the pursuit of wealth into something almost predatory, in which community life becomes incredibly competitive, what resources are available are now fought over, and a rise in crime, in vice, in violence, um, you know, from black on other black, especially men against women, have come far more to the forefront. This is something that West notes is also reflected in the crisis of black leadership, right? Why, asks West, are civil rights leaders or post-civil rights leaders less meaningful than pre. Now, where are the Martin Luther Kings of today, the Frederick Douglasses, the Malcolm Xs? Um, it's a difficult question to answer because there's not one reason, there's not one um, cause. But the emergence of a black middle class, argues West, prevents the cultivation of quality leadership for collective well-being. So as you can kind of see, West puts the predominance of collective well-being over individual self-advancement. Now, if you believe that collective well-being is more important than individualization, then fine, you're going to believe his theories, and you're going to understand why he has so many problems with many black leaders today. Um, if you, on the other hand, believe that it is inevitable, right, that individualization will sort of evolve out of collective self-interest, right? This is kind of like if collective uh, benefit, if collective well-being is sort of a, a way of group survival within a period of uncertainty and hardship, well, then eventually things are going to get better where everybody just kind of elevates and alleviates themselves one by one. So do we blame the black middle class? Um, no more than we should blame the white middle class. Um, but those that emerge into right, a middle class, um, even a higher class, end up, according to West, and this is where they, you know, the controversy kind of sets in, they lose their blackness. Right? They lose their sense of where they came from, and they appear to be largely indifferent, almost dismissive of those of a community that haven't made it along with them. And along with that is the black political leadership, which, according to West, appears too hungry for status to be angry, too eager for acceptance to be bold, and too self-invested in advancement to be defiant. So black leadership has less to do with fighting on behalf of the collective welfare of the entire group that still undergoes discrimination, harassment, and racism. And more to the point, 
uses that for sound bites, um, for um, you know performative artwork. Um, you know, the anger when shown appears to be more rhetorical than personal. And here is where West notes his criticism of contemporary black leaders whom, in so many words, he just simply dismisses as posers, right? Cory Booker being one of them. Barack Obama, West has an enormous degree of disappointment, enormous disappointment in Barack Obama as someone who could have and should have used his platform for the presidency in really addressing some deep-seated underlying inequalities of black America ends up becoming little more than the spokesperson for <clears throat> neoliberal capitalism, right? Once the Clintons became no longer marketable, Obama is put up there as, you know, sort of the, the, the new slogan, the, the new image. And he tends to, you know, be less interested in the plight of his fellow people. Right? Now, do we blame Obama for not? I mean, again, we don't really know what Obama thinks, but West has basically said Obama abandoned the cause and squandered his opportunities as president. Black leadership today is mostly categorized into three categories. Race effacing, which tries to eliminate the idea of racism and says, look, racism will eventually be abolished, but I don't see color. I see only character. This is done for the purpose of really reaching a larger white constituency while keeping a loyal black one. This apparently might be something that Booker or Obama do. Race identifying tends to appear to be following in the footsteps of many of the civil rights leaders, right? Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and others. But because of individualization, because politics today sort of promotes personal advancement over sticking to larger ideals that might not necessarily be electable, there appears to be patterns of black leaders fighting amongst one another for who gets to defend and speak on behalf of black turf while serving as power brokers with non-black elites to enhance this turf. Right? So in the same way as race effacing, this sort of ends up being uh, people that white groups need to appease and gain support to prove their tolerance and support for inclusivity. So at the end of the day, black leadership in the race identifying category identify as blacks, appear to speak on behalf of the black community, um, but kind of just hold the fort. Right? They provide the space for people like Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden or Elizabeth Warren to, you know, make a pit stop every so often, give some speech with, you know, flowery but altogether innocuous platitudes about how we need to all come together. Uh, the black race has, you know, been discriminated against. We have to do something about it. But at the end of the day, nothing really happens. The speech is given, the officials nod and approve, and then tell their constituents to vote Democratic, right? This is the Jim Clyburn's of the uh, you know, Black Democratic Caucus as well. Um, and then finally, you got a very, very small group that West says is almost non-existent, and that is the race transcending. This is the group that needs to grow in order to carry on the message of the pre-civil rights era. The idea that there are still millions of blacks in this country that remain um, isolated, off the political radar and are subject to the worst cases of institutionalized poverty and irrelevancy out there. Those that will speak on behalf of, let's say, the poor black families of Flint, Michigan, who have no other option but to literally drink the toxic water that comes out of their faucets because they have no money to afford anything else. The race transcending elements, however, tend to be, I, mean, I don't want to say manipulated, but they tend to be much more gravitated towards, again, grand, you know, political grandstanding than actual grassroots movements, right? So the activism on the ground, the community building, tends to be lost within this new era of individual promoting neoliberalism. And it's within this understanding that West notes the pitfalls of racial reasoning. Whereas black leadership today will 
rally round anyone that is black, regardless of their character, their conduct, or past political practices. So, you know, while this book was written originally in the early 90s, right, so he's focusing on things that happened back then, one of his big critiques was the near silence of black leadership in critiquing and criticizing the conduct of Clarence Thomas, right? You all remember Clarence Thomas, he's still a Supreme Court justice who went through a rather um, messy um, vetting process. Um, and within that vetting, um, in comes um, Anita Hill, who had accused him of sexual harassment, misconduct, um, intimidation, and all sorts of other um, unsavory elements. Um, you know, Thomas, you know, denounces her as an opportunist, someone who was just using this as a bully pulpit to get her 15 minutes of time. And when he realizes that, you know, he's not winning over support over this, he plays the black card and then says, I'm being discriminated against because I'm black. Not because of what I did, but because I'm being black. And there are, you know, in, in so many words, he kind of implied to everyone within the Senate hearing committees that you all have done this, but you all have gotten away with it because you're white. Why should I be persecuted because I'm black? And all of a sudden, right, the, uh, you know, the, the Senate uh, committees felt that they didn't want to put him up as some sacrificial lamb. So they decided to accept him. And he's been a Supreme Court justice ever since. Um, what West is saying is that this would have been the absolute perfect opportunity for black leadership to not only call out the personal misconduct of one of their own, but also to question whether he really was authentic and sympathetic towards the black community. Because his policies as a lawyer, as a judge, have been overwhelmingly detrimental to the black community. He's, you know, he was uh, you know, someone who just kind of graduated from Yale, not at the top of his class. He was relatively a mediocre judge, a middle range lawyer. And apparently he decided that he was going to play the race card to advance, right? This is West's argument here. And the black leadership at the time really did nothing to call him out on his lack of qualifications. The idea is that, is he black? Is he? He is black. Then all black leadership closed ranks around him and offers unconditional solidarity because one of our own needs to advance. But what this does is it covers up and defends negative character traits and stereotypes simply for the sake of making certain that one of our own advances. So rather than the notion of a black official achieving the ranks of power because of moral principles and ideals that benefit the entire community, we are now just simply using him as a media image, a marketing image. Oh, a, you know, a black person on the Supreme Court. And let's forget about his actual conduct and his personal beliefs, which explains why Thomas is one of the most conservative judges on the Supreme Court, not one that is really um, favorable towards liberal progressive ideas that would help poor members of the black community. So black support for other blacks happens because of their identity, not because of their politics. So in addition to Clarence Thomas, right, West has pointed out the very same type of, um, you know, closing in ranks that happened with Barack Obama um, and Jim Clyburn, right? The black community all rallied around Barack Obama, even when it was known that he would continue many cases, the socioeconomic policies of George W. Bush, and, you know, many others of neoliberal corporatism that has undermined and, you know, effectively weakened the lower classes, the working class, the poorer classes of society. Jim Clyburn is one that um, you may remember about a year ago, stepped in and largely was one of the people that sabotaged uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign um, by throwing his weight and the Congressional Black Caucus behind Joe Biden. Now, Biden has a noted record of discrimination, racial harassment. The man is one of the major archetypes of the, you know, the, of the carceral state in this country. Um, one of the main, main um, authors of a security apparatus that has led us to where we are today. 
But Jim Clyburn, big name within the Democratic Party, may have received his marching orders from up above and decides that instead of throwing his support behind someone like Bernie Sanders, who is much more open and willing to address the inequalities of the black working class, is going to throw his weight and his support behind right, the neoliberal entity, which, mind you, remember, before the South Carolina primaries, Biden was polling fourth and fifth place. Like, he was basically just one vote, one primary away from being irrelevant. And all of a sudden, Obama and Clyburn come to Biden's aid, and West sees this as an absolute betrayal, as an absolute stab in the back. Now, West was a big, big, big Bernie Sanders fan and still is today. And it is sort of interesting how, you know, we're talking about the, you know, the need for black leadership to speak on behalf of the black community. West had regarded Sanders as the, you know, most emblematic black leader um, in a long, long time. But, you know, you work with what you're given. And because Biden is really no friend to, you know, the working classes, the lower classes in that regard, um, except as a soundbite for somebody who used to take the train from, you know, Delaware to D.C. all the time. Okay, great. He's a, you know, he, he, he likes public transportation. I mean, the man is, is a political elite. And in that sense, the leadership of people like Obama and Clyburn show once again that opportunism is going to get in the way of collective benefit and progressive ideas. So what can be done, right? With all of this, you might think to yourself, well, there's no point in getting up in the morning. Um, and, you know, in many situations here, you know, understanding uh, the collective plight of, you know, the black community can be really, really depressing, right? Especially if you are not a member of them. But what can be done? Um, West offers a few steps for, you know, alleviating uh, many of these problems. The first is the understanding that the nihilistic threat to black America is unfortunately inseparable from a crisis in black leadership. Now, West has been somewhat critical of black leadership over the past 30 or so years. Um, probably his most preferred leader, his most preferred intellectual, is Jesse Jackson. Um, and he came the closest, right, in the 1980s. Uh, towards realizing this sense of progressivism, right, with his whole rainbow coalition. The only trouble with Jackson is that he just seems to be unable to galvanize, mobilize, you know, movements and communities at the local level. So, you know, Jesse Jackson is, in West's mind, probably still the best that we have, but someone who leads from the top down rather than is able to encourage and mobilize people from the bottom up. Um, he doesn't have much to say uh, about people like Al Sharpton, especially since Sharpton represents this type of sensational opportunism, um, you know, where he will defend and identify as part of the black community, um, but is one that, you know, just simply holds the fort and fights among other peers like him for who gets to speak on behalf of that black community. And, you know, in that sense, years, you know, give way to decades and, you know, blacks begin to note um, the idea that their votes are auctioned every four years, right? They are only important during election season where candidates need to, you know, have their photo op with you know, the right community leaders in the right community centers or churches. Um, but once that speech has been given, once the photos have been taken, there's little that's actually done to alleviate many of the problems of these communities. So there is a need, West argues, for a new race transcending figure, or maybe even a group of transcending figures, right? That there's not one person that I think can speak on behalf of black America anymore. There's not one person that can speak on behalf of the, you know, increasing multivaried levels of black socioeconomic income and identity. But what needs to happen is a race transcending group of individuals, right, need to harness the growing sense of progressivism within this country. And it's happening, right? It, you know, it kind of started with let's say the Bernie Sanders movement of the 19, uh, I'm sorry, the 19, of 2016, but has kind of taken on sort of this decentralized, leaderless role 
um, that is now, you know, wonder, people are wondering who will speak on behalf of, uh, you know, the progressive left. You know, Sanders is sort of in the twilight of his political career. Is it going to be someone like AOC? Is it going to be um, Nina Turner? Is it going to be uh, Jamal Bowman? Who will it be? Whoever it is or whatever groups, right, need to harness ideas of progressivism and social democracy of the civil rights era for contemporary political um, rhetoric. Why? Because these things still matter. Because inequality, harassment, discrimination, police brutality, these things are real. They are not political statements trying to score points. They are real. It is raw. It is visible. It is unavoidable. And all of these are part of a failing socioeconomic system that has augmented the racism of a socio-political system. A political system that in attempt to maintain some status quo of, if not white superiority, definitely white leverage, has been used to demobilize, threaten, intimidate, and discriminate against not just blacks, but people of color. And so unfortunately, right, we end this discussion today on an acknowledgement of the systemic racism that still permeates many levels of American political society. And so even though these essays that West wrote were done in the early 90s, he is still very much of the mind that black nihilism has continued over the next 30 years and has gotten even worse and is being augmented, as Giraud notes, by a pervasive system that targets, demoralizes, discriminates, and dehumanizes a group of people simply by their skin color and by their out-group um, perceptions of identity. So what can be done is there needs to effectively be a new degree of leadership that takes on many of the older uh, theories, values, and purposes that led to the civil rights era of the 1960s, but with the understanding that we're not done. You can't just simply sign a document at the, up, at the upper level without seeing many of these things implemented at the local and state. And that, I think, you know, is a good way for us to come to an end here. Like I said, this was not by any means exhaustive. The politics of black identity deserves a standalone course. And as I said, I am not an expert in that. So I don't feel qualified to speak any more than what I am just simply, you know, providing from Henry Giraud and Cornell West from this week. Next week, we are going to be looking at the politics of white identity. Now, this should be interesting. And not just necessarily white supremacy, but the idea that whites, especially working class whites, see themselves as the most discriminated, as the most victimized. How do these narratives work? And how do they work vis-a-vis -vis competing narratives of black victimization? Right? So we are just simply ending one part of a larger concept of collective group identity and placing that identity within a larger framework of many different collective memories. So. I look forward to your comments and your input in class this Wednesday, as well as your input in the discussion forums. See you then.